right, so today what we're going to do is we're going to go into part two of the teaching we started on the first holy day, which was also a Shabbat. And this, um, this teaching was called, we entitled it, Where Are We Going? Where are we going? Because after all, don't you think that was probably one of the biggest questions the Israelites were asking as they came out of Egypt, is where are we going? And what we did was we tried to put on their shoes. And we tried to put ourselves in their sort of you know, situation and imagine what it would have been like to come to that night of Passover and then that morning and leaving and the whole idea of, wow, we're free, but where are we going and what do we do and what is it like to go through all of that? And, and, and I'm sure they were still processing what all they had experienced too because they had experienced some tremendous, unbelievable miracles. I mean, the signs and wonders were just unprecedented. We haven't seen it since. I mean, this was just an unbelievable time. So they're processing all these things. And so we then examined what the disciples and the believers must have been thinking as Yeshua went through his experience in the flesh of coming to that Passover and being uh, offered up as the Passover lamb, so to speak, and being the lamb of Elohim, and how they must have felt as, as he died and then was resurrected, and they ended up starting their own sort of journey of the deal that they had to go through. And so hopefully you guys thought about then, as I asked you as your homework, was to think about how does that relate to us now? I mean, how does it relate to the journey we're going through? Because you know what? A lot of us, like the Israelites in the first exodus, we're still processing a lot of stuff. There's a lot to process as we come out of Egypt, so to speak. You know, there's a lot of things that we, we have to deal with. And we talked about during the Passover Seder, the idea of coming out of the spiritual bondage before you come out of the physical bondage. So we're not all being collected right now to be brought back to the land. But we're going through this breaking of the spiritual bondage. And so we're having to process a lot of new ideas and new thoughts because after all, these slaves were dealing with a whole different system than where they were going. And so there's a lot to process. And so then here we are, hopefully getting ready for the, the greater exodus. I'm sure you've all heard that phrase, the lesser exodus and the greater exodus, or the type and shadow. The exodus was a type and shadow of what's coming. And so as we can prepare for that, I want us to look at the whole thought and idea of where are we going? Because that really, I think, is the most press, pressing need, a pressing question that we probably all have is, where are we going? And I know that we have ideas about it. We know we're going to the promised land. We're going to the land at some point. We also know that this gets referred to as the kingdom is coming. We're going towards the kingdom. That's where we're going, the kingdom. We're also told that we're going to the wedding feast. And these are all things that are sort of in some way synonymous as we head in that direction. They're all part of that process of the ultimate living forever with our Elohim. Which then brings us to who will be there. Who's going to be there? Because when we look at the first exodus, I don't know. It seems to me they didn't all get to go there, did they? As a matter of fact, on a percentage basis, <laughs> out of 600,000 men that were counted, how many got to go in? Two. That doesn't count the women and children either. I'm saying when they counted the men and did the census, two. Well, let's see. Let's do the math. Two out of 600,000. That's not real good odds. Okay, that's not high percentages right there. So who's going to be there? Okay, I believe the kingdom will be filled. Now, I know this is going to shock you like you've never heard this from you before. With those who have become the type of people that Yahweh wants to live with forever. Okay, I know that shocks you. It's, it's just, you know, you didn't see that coming. But I believe the kingdom is going to, but, but don't just say, oh, I've heard you say that before. But think about what that is. That's the reality of why I've been teaching this to you. When I've been teaching you about are you becoming the type of person, the reason is because those are the ones who are going to be there. If you're not, you're not. If you're not becoming the type of person that Yahweh wants to spend forever with, he's not going to spend forever with you. It's his choice. We cannot obligate him. That's part of the discussions you find in the Brick Hadashah and some of the arguments is the idea of, well, you're not going to get in by your works. Well, that's true. In other words, you can't say to Abba, look at all the works I did, you have to let me in. Because you could do a lot of works and still be obnoxious and a jerk and not the type of person he wants to live forever with. Oh, but, oh, but, but, I, but I kept the Sabbath and I kept the feast and I got all the leaven out of my house. I even threw out my toaster. Okay? I'm just saying... Okay, and, 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 you know, keep adding all the list of the, I did this and I did that, I did, I did, I did. And it's good, you have to, I did, I did, I did. But guess what? 
If that's all you did, you get to the idea of you worthless and useless servant. You just did everything I told you to do, but you didn't do the rest of it. Where was your heart? Where was your attitude? Where was your approach? Where were the weightier things? Where was that fruit of the Ruach? Where was the gentleness and the meekness, the love and the joy and the patience, etc.? And so, I think we need to understand that as we're getting excited about going somewhere, let's remember who gets to go there. The wheat get to go, the tares don't. Amen. And so how do you know if you're a wheat or a tear? I don't know, let's, that, what, maybe that has to do with the examining process. We're supposed to be examining ourselves. You know, Elder Kevin talked about that yesterday. Examining yourself. There's still time to examine yourself. Well, it's not just about examining yourself at the feast. We should be always doing a self-check, to see a self-inventory, to see where we're at in the process. But it really has to do with becoming the type of person that Yahweh wants to live with forever. Because forever is a long time. We talk about this all the time, but forever is a long time, and he's not stupid. Amen. Can we all agree to that? Amen. So he's basically going to sit down, and I know a lot of times ministries never talk about it this way. He's not going to sit down and just look at a list of, well, you broke this law and you sinned here and you did this good and you did that good and, and just have this balance sheet checklist and, and, we, and you wonder what the curve is, you know? <laughs> what kind of curve is he grading this on? No, I don't think it's going to be anything like that. I think it's going to be knowing everything that you did, knowing who you are, he's going to look you in the eyes and decide, do I want to spend forever with this person? This is the type of person that I can trust, that I will enjoy spending time with, that's gentle and loving, etc. Because after all, when you look at the fruit of the Spirit, isn't the people with that the kind of people you think you'd enjoy spending time with? Amen. Joyful, loving, kind, meek, gentle, patient, self-controlled people. Right? So why wouldn't that be the same thing for him? Because after all, the whole point of this, when I say this, I mean like everything, like life, is because this is the, the proving ground and the and the, and the development ground for him to find out who is going to be the type of person he wants to live with forever. Who's going to make it to that place? And it's not about being perfect. It's about wanting to be perfect. It's not about, it's not about, it's not about being perfectly patient or joyful or loving or kind. It's about wanting to be those things. Making the effort to do those things. And how does he know if you're making the effort? Because when you fall short, you make the shuva. You turn around and get back on the path. You repent. And so that's a really important part of the process. You know, it says in, Re in Revelation 19, 7, that the bride has prepared herself. That the bride has prepared herself. And that's a really important thing here when we talk about the wedding. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give him praise for the marriage of the Lamb has come. You know, we've heard songs like that with that verse, and we all talk about it, we're all excited about it. But see, the rest of the verse says, it says the Lamb... Uh, the marriage of the Lamb has come, it says, and his bride or his wife has prepared herself. It doesn't say, and his wife or his bride has been prepared by me and I did all the work for her. She's prepared herself. And so the whole point of your life is to prepare yourself for that wedding. That's the point of life, is to get yourself ready for this. And so, are you preparing yourself? Because, see, that was part of the preparations and the instructions even when they were coming out in the first exodus was they were told, you're going to get a lamb, you're going to examine it, you're going to hold it for a couple of days, then you're going to slaughter it, you're going to cook it, you're going to put blood on your doorpost. I mean, there were very specific details and instructions to be prepared for that exodus. Amen. Well, we have very inst clear instructions and preparations that we're told to make to be prepared for the kingdom. And so that's the beauty of having the word in written form. It's an easy reference to pick up, hold, and look up by the way, I wonder what the, what the preparation I'm supposed to be doing in the area of, and then fill in the dots, in the, in the, way, in the way I eat. I wonder what, what, the, what, is, what would a bride who's eating correctly look like? Oh, there's a chapter on that called Leviticus 11. Well, what about feasts and observances? Oh, we got Leviticus 23. Well, what about, and you just keep filling them in. and keep filling them in. So how do we get there? How do we get to where we're going? Well, what did Israel do? Did they take a bus? Did they get in a plane? What'd they do? They walked. Guess what? You're going to walk to the kingdom too. It's called halakha. Okay, the Hebrew word halakh means to walk. So your halakha is your walk. And so we have instructions on what the halakha is. How do we get there? Go to John 14. And this was quoted, I know, during 
the earlier uh, session when the children were making their presentation, I, I heard um, Stephanie mention it, but in John 14, 6, Yeshua said to them, said to him, I am the way. So you want to know how to get there? He tells you, I am the way. I'm the way. Because Thomas asked him, Master, we do not know where you're going. How are we able to know, know the way? And he says, I am the way. So what does that mean? It means if you do what he did, if you follow him, if you become like him, if you transform into his image, if you follow his instructions, he's giving you the way. And so if you want to know how to get there, you look to him. But don't look to him to do it for you. He's not going to do it for you. He's going to show you how to do it. He's going to teach you how to do it. He's going to maybe even help you do some of the things that are really difficult for you to do and encourage you to do it. He'll cheer you on. But he's not going to do it for you because he wants you to do it. He wants to see the character you have to do this thing because it's all about character. And that's what we talked about in Deuteronomy 8 too, right? He was testing them to prove whether it was in their heart to do things. It was a character test. That's why he led them through the wilderness. By the way, part one of that is to humble them. If you read the verse, it says, he led them through the wilderness for 40 years to humble them so that he could test them and prove what their heart was all about. Whether their heart was to obey and keep his commandments. Because what is the very short, simple version of the covenant? Exodus 19 tells you, if you do what I say, if you obey, I will accept you as my people. Nothing about that has ever changed. That is the plan of salvation. If you obey, I will accept you. But he doesn't want just mechanical obedience. He wants you to do it with joy, with desire. He wants you to do it in a certain way. Now in Deuteronomy 10, 12, we haven't gotten to that in a while, so I, I knew we'd find an excuse to get there, so we're there today. In Deuteronomy 10, 12, the Israelites are asking Moses a very interesting question. Toma asked Yeshua, how do we get there? What's the way? Guess what? Moses knew that the Israelites are wondering the same thing. And so here in chapter 10 of Deuteronomy in Devarim in verse 12, it says, And now Yisrael, what is Yahweh really asking of you? What does he want us to do? It says, but to fear Yahweh your Elohim. So he wants you to fear him. Walk in all of his ways. And to love him and to serve Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being. To guard his commands of Yahweh, the commands of Yahweh and his laws, which by the way, I command you today, which are for your good. And so we have this instruction here in Deuteronomy 10, 12 and 13 where I think it really lays out the process of what he expects you to do. He wants you to, first of all, fear him. If you're not fearing and awing and reverencing him, you have no motivation to do any of this. Because that means that you're fearing and awing and reverencing someone else. Somebody else is getting a higher level of authority in your life. And that's why I would highly recommend listening to the teaching on the fear of Yahweh, because that's where it all begins. No shock then that when you read places like in Proverbs and other places where it says, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of understanding. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. That's it. Well, that pretty much sounds like everything you need. Wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Well, what, where does it start? The fear of Yahweh. And so that's the first thing Moses says that Yahweh wants is you, for you to fear him. And then because you fear him, guess what you may want to do? Walk in all of his ways because you want to please him. By the way, the fear that I mentioned in the teaching on the fear of Yahweh is a, a fear of disappointing him. To, to have such awe and reverence for him that the thing that you're afraid of is having to look down on you, shaking his head less, saying, what, what, what were you thinking? What, what was that? Why did you do that? Why would you treat somebody like that? Why would you behave like that? That's the thing we should be afraid of. By the way, as little children, if we had good awe and respect for our parents, that was the thing we were afraid of more than the smack. That, that look of major disappointment in their face. Spouses, you've seen this look sometimes. Hopefully not very often, but you know what I'm talking about. When you've done something and your wife or husband looks at you with, I can't believe you just did that. And you know how that hurts more than almost anything. Sad part is it's usually at a family event, usually their family. <laughs> I'm just saying. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Okay, where you get that look of, you know, they look at the sky, they roll their eyes, their head drops, and they're like, I can't believe you did that. How could, if you were respected and awed and reverenced me, you would not embarrass me like that. 
And that's basically what Yahweh is saying is don't embarrass me. Don't claim to be mine and do all these things that embarrass me. If you have that fear, you'll walk in his ways. And that's the whole point. Israel, when they came out of Egypt initially, they had a little bit of the fear of the whip, the fear of the one that just destroyed Egypt, but they didn't have that reverence of fearing disappointing the one who just destroyed Egypt. They had to learn that. They had to learn that. Hopefully in your life, you've been learning that. And then after you begin walking in all of his ways, guess what you discover? That his ways bless you. His ways keep you safe. His ways are a transformational part of the work that happens to take you from what you are into what he is. And you realize that he gave you these things because he loves you. And he's expressing his love to you in his instructions. Because it's loving to tell you what he expects of you. It's loving to show you what will keep you safe. It's loving to show you what will bring blessing. It's loving to show you how you can actually transform into his image. And so what happens after that? Then at that point you truly start to fall in love with him. Because now you've received the love. And you're reciprocating that love. You're responding to his love. This is not the way Christianity does. Christianity plays a, nice, a bunch of music, gets a worship song going, and creates a mood that creates an emotional excitement. An emotional response. There's nothing emotional about this. I'm not saying it doesn't end up being emotional. But your motivation isn't emotional. You fear him because you respect and awe and reverence him. You actually start walking in his ways. You receive and realize how much he loves you, which, by the way, is very emotional. And now you have a natural, proper response of loving him. In the right order, this makes all the sense in the world. I've been at the back room behind a stage when they were about to do an altar call at a big concert many years ago where the leaders who are about to, these are big time, big name praise and worship singers who are about to do this little thing to get everybody all hooped up and souped up and whatever. And they're saying to the people, they had the leadership coming to the back behind the stage and say, we're about to do this and these people are not going to have any idea what they just did. And my first thought was, excuse me, then why are you doing it? What is the point? Why are you doing something that these people are going to have no idea what they did? Then what was the point of it? I mean, they made, it, they made a commitment, not knowing what they did, then what kind of commitment is that? Because I thought an altar call was some sort of like making a commitment, right? You're, you're going to give yourself and accept uh, whatever, Messiah is your personal savior, whatever. whatever. I don't know, I don't, I've not done any altar call things. But this was that something I didn't expect. I was actually going to hear some music, and they did an altar call. And then they asked for the youth leaders and, and, and pastors to come in the back, so I got up and went. I wasn't one at the time, but I wanted to know what they were doing. And my wife looked at me like, where are you going? I said, I want to know what they're doing. So I went in the back and got to witness all that. But it's been a great testimony ever since because it proves my point. That there is nothing that we should be giving significance to in an altar call when it's done in that way. When it's, it's about evoking an emotional response that has no basis in, in rational or logical or understanding in the decision. And that's a key thing. By the way, part of it also is, <laughs> they've got it completely upside down, inside out. They're going for you to accept somebody as your personal savior. Yeshua is not your personal anything. Maybe that scares people and they don't understand. You're his personal something. He's been the savior whether you accept him or not. He's the savior whether you ever believe in him or not. So he's not your personal anything. You do need to, at some point, accept and acknowledge that you've come to the realization that he is who he is. But you're accepting and acknowledging that he is who he is. He doesn't become your anything. You become his. You actually, you always were, because he bought you with a price. You only come to the knowledge that you're his. You've always been his. Because it says you were bought with a price. That price, when Yeshua died, he said, I give my life for who? The body? Did he say the body? Did he say Christians? Did he say Jews? The whole world. So everybody's been bought and paid for. They just don't know it. And so what you're doing is at some point you were delivered. People ask me, well, when were you saved? And what were you Look, I can tell you when I came out of the ignorance, when I was delivered from the ignorance that there was a Savior. I can tell you when I was delivered from the ignorance that that Savior paid for me and bought me with a price. See, these are things we were delivered out of in our ignorance. But there was a payment that was made. And so then we go through this process of loving him. And guess what happens? Once we fall in love with him, now we want to serve him. 
Because isn't that something that we do when we fall in love with our spouses? We want to start doing nice things for them, especially when we're dating. Once we say, I do, it gets a little bit precarious. <laughs> and that's sad. But once we, when, when we fall in love, we start wanting to do nice things and looking for opportunities to serve them and do things for them. So when we fall in love, we do that. And then he says, look, I want you to do this with all your heart, with all your being. Because he doesn't want you just doing it mechanically. He wants you doing it with all your heart, with all your being. Now you're doing it in its fullness. So that's what it's all about. Now let's take that understanding and go to Deuteronomy 6. And we've read this a million times. We read it earlier today. The Shema and the Vahafta. But what I want to help you to understand is that, well, let me put it a different way. I want you to be asking this question. As you read things in Scripture, I want you to ask this question. What does this look like in action in my life? What should this look like in action in my life? So let's take the Deuteronomy 6.4. It says, Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Yisrael. Yahweh, our Elohim, Yahweh is one. He says, And you shall love Yahweh, our, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And these words I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. And you shall impress them upon your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We've all read that probably every Shabbat and probably much more often than that. And it becomes just words. Well, let's break it down a little bit. It starts off with Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel. We're supposed to have ears to hear. And those ears to hear are so that you can take action. The Shema has, a, has based in the Hebrew the idea of hear and do. Hear and then take action. Hear and listen and then take action. And so then he describes to you what kind of actions he wants you to take. He wants you to love him with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your strength. That doesn't leave a whole lot of room for giving that kind of love or attention to anything else. He said all. I want all your love, all your strength, all your might, all your being. I want you to give that to me. You're going to love me with all of that stuff. He says, in these words as I'm commanding you, they, they have to be in your heart. We got 24 parts of a teaching trying to explain all that. About getting these things into your heart. It's called the heart of the matter. Okay? It's worth listening to 24 hours of this stuff. Because that's probably the most important teaching there is out there that I've done. Is getting the heart right. The heart of the matter. And he says, look, I want you to have these words in your heart. Does that sound mechanical? I want you to get these words in your head. In your head, it becomes mechanical. Okay, I don't do this, do that. Okay, I got that figured out. It's in my head. I'm going to make sure I don't eat these certain things. I'm going to show up on these days. I'm going to... That's very mechanical. He wants it to go from your head into your heart where you're doing it with a joy and with a desire to please your Elohim. It's a whole different thing. Your motivation changes from getting it right to being pleasing. Let me say that again. From getting it right to being pleasing in his sight. How that rhymes, how nice. Okay? But that's the thing, is we have to be going for that pleasing in his sight rather than just getting the mechanics of it correct. And then he says, and you shall impress these things upon your children. By the way, that's not a suggestion. None of this is a suggestion. He says, and these words I command you today shall be in your heart. And I'm commanding you, instructing you, and you shall impress these things. Impress, okay. Think about it, making an impression in something. Taking a weighted or strong thing and making an impression in clay or in, or in something, you have to, it takes a lot of pressure. It takes effort to make an impression into something. If you're looking at something physical. We have to impress these things into our children. There's an effort involved to get our children to understand and a continuous putting it in there, putting it in there, putting it in there, right? And this is how we do it, though. You want to know how we can impress these things? Well, how about if you speak of them when you're sitting in your house? And what about also when you're walking by the way? What about when you lie down and when you rise up? Do you think these things may make, you know, that may make a difference if you're talking about it, I don't know, all the time? If, but that doesn't mean that every word that comes out of your mouth, it means that whenever there's an opportunity, and by the way, there's a million a day, that something's happening, you say, oh, see how this fits into what Yahweh said? Teach your children. Teach each other. Observe it for yourself. And then he says, he says, and you're going to bind them as a sign on your hand and they'll be as frontlets between your eyes. 
Let's get away from the whole idea, well, that this is tefillin. In other words, that you're talking about the physical. We're taking it deeper. It has to do with what you're thinking and what you're doing. And so now we're not just talking about an action saying, okay, the mechanics. It's like, what are you thinking? Because Yeshua talked about the idea of if you're thinking about murder or if you're thinking about adultery, if you're thinking about it, you already broke the command. So what are you thinking? And by the way, that's a teaching we've done called What Are You Thinking? Because that's an important piece of this. And you may want to listen to that. And so, and by the way, that comes out of all of these little pieces. Of, as, as I'm reading these scriptures, I go, you know what? There's probably enough information to do a whole teaching just on that one idea. As a matter of fact, I, I've been wanting to take the, the Shema and the Vahafta and turn that into a teaching series. And so that's something maybe someday we'll get to. Maybe we're doing a little bit now. <laughs> and so, then he says... And, they shall, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So not only is it going to be what you're thinking and what you're doing and while you're sleeping and when you're walking and when you're in your house and whatever you're doing, which pretty much covers the all day and all night and everything else, but your house should be visibly and clearly a house that represents the Almighty, where Torah is done, where obedience exists, where, reverend, where Deuteronomy 10.12 is happening. The fear of Yahweh, walking in all his ways, right? All this loving him, serving him. That all those things are happening in that house. People should know that that is a house where those things are happening. That's how we get there. Remember, this goes back to the question, was that where are we going and how do we get there? Well, you get there by acknowledging that Yeshua is the way. Well, we say, let's, let's tie this all together then. Yeshua says, I am the way. He also says, I am the truth and I am the life. And we've, we've said this almost ad nauseum, but we need to just keep saying it. We have the verses that prove that Yeshua is the Torah. He's the walking, talking, living fulfillment and fullness of the word. Because he says, I am the truth. We know that in Psalm 119, it says his word is truth. Actually, John 17, 17 says the same thing. Thy word is truth. John 1, in verse uh, 14, it says that the word put on flesh. So the word is truth. Yeshua is truth. The word, it all works perfectly in a nice, nice, neat, tied circle. So when he says, I am the way, he's also saying, Torah is the way. But it's not just Torah mechanically. It's Torah in the context of Mashiach, in the context of the Ruach and the fruit, tying it all together. I am the way. And by the way, when he says, I am the way, he was the most completely submissive being that's ever walked this planet. So submissiveness is an important part of this. Because he said very clearly, there's not a thing I do or say that my father hasn't told me to say or do. You don't get any more submissive than that. And so let's continue. So we're looking at these things. We're looking at the, the kind of the how do we get there. And I want to talk about what it looks like in action. What does this all look like in action? Well, I think that this looks like as far as where we're going and applying these things, it looks a little bit like community. What I mean by that is that the Chagim that we are given give us an opportunity to rehearse community. I think that it's a community that he's building. Because I don't think it says that he's going to live with us forever and it's going to be like he's going to visit you and spend time with you privately by yourself and you privately by yourself. And We're all going to be there together as a community of people living forever with the Almighty. And so he's building a community. Remember, Israel came out as a nation and was brought to the land to be a nation in the land. That's a type and shadow of what we're looking forward to. Is a community living together. Amen? Okay, so, in the community, we're going to have certain things that we're going to have to be able to do. And we have an instruction that we are to love one another as he has loved us. And so, that's going to have to be done in community. Now, let me ask you a question. Are we doing that now? Not most of us. Are most of us loving each other as he's loved us? I think we fall short. And so we have to work on that area. You know, this instruction was given as they were about to go into community. As Yeshua is telling the disciples, they were about to start building a new community. Which gets birth in Acts chapter 2 when they start building community. That first century model starts getting built after he tells them, look, they will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And so that instruction to love one another, of course, that's always been there, but he gave that specific instruction knowing they're about to go into community. And so here we have this idea of, well, 
How do we love one another as he's loved us? And this is very difficult until we first get the plank out of our own eye. See, the plank in the eye thing is not just about, I know when people tell that, they're always like, well, you've got stuff to deal with too. I want you to look at it a little bit differently. It blinds you. You can't see through a giant plank in your eye. You know, if that plank is in your eye, you know, you, you have problems seeing clearly what, we, what you need and others need. Because a plank blocks your vision. How are you going to see someone who's hungry or thirsty or in need of clothing or whatever if you, if you have planks in your eye blocking your vision? No, I'm not taking away from the metaphor of like, hey, you've got your own stuff to work on. Deal with that first before you worry about the twig and your brothers. But I'm talking about it also blocks your vision. You know, it's very difficult for us to get that plank out of our eye and, and to see clearly until we understand that we have to deal with our own stuff. And part of our own stuff is the body needs to get healthy psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually, and physically. But quite frankly, the physical stuff isn't, what kill, isn't what's killing the body. It's the psychological, emotional, and spiritual stuff that's killing the body. It's how we treat each other and how we treat ourselves. Okay, we are very toxic. We are very mixed up, confused, unstable, abused, broken, damaged. The list can go on and on. We have to get healthy. You can't really love your brother, if you're having enough trouble loving yourself. You understand? It says, how can you love the, the, the unseen one if you can't even love your brother who you've seen? How's that for a sobering thought? Do we actually really ask? But ask yourself, what does that look like in my life? If I'm having trouble loving myself, how can I really love Elohim? Because, quite frankly, if I can't love myself, I probably don't think I'm worthy of love, and I probably don't think that why would he even think to love me? Look at me, I'm not worthy of love. He can't possibly love this. If you're having trouble with these things. And so, basically, can we agree that Israel had the same problem when they came out of Egypt? Do you think their self-esteem was real high? Do they think they felt real worthy of anything? They've been already told they were worse than garbage, that they weren't even human. They were very much dehumanized. I mean, after all, when you watch the, all the Exodus movies, what do you hear from the pharaohs often? Well, they're just slaves. In other words, they're not people. They're not human. They're just slaves. Hasn't that happened again and again and again through history? The idea of dehumanizing. Oh, and it doesn't have to be with slaves. We just dehumanize others because we have this problem in our psychological, emotional, and spiritual insides. We're a, we're, there's a lot of mess in there. We're very toxic. And so it's not just the idea that we're mixed up and confused, but we're toxic. In other words, we are dangerous and painfully uh, you know, wreaking havoc with other people because of that toxic stuff that's going on in us. Toxic means that you come in contact with me and I'm toxic, you are in danger. You know, those hazmat things, toxic materials, it means that if you come into contact with it, it could cause serious harm. Well, how does that work with people? If we're very toxic people, think about the damage we're causing. And we all, it's not, it's not hard for you to know other people that you know are toxic. Oh yeah, you know, and you might give them a wide berth and stay away from them a little bit. But what about how toxic you are? We're all dealing with this stuff. You know, we're all, you know, basically we're dysfunctional. And what I mean by that is we're not functioning according to the original manufacturer's specifications. This is not the way he meant, intended for us to function. So we are dysfunctional. We're not functioning the way he made us to function. And I'm not talking about people with birth defects and these other things that happen. I'm talking about those of you who certainly have the ability to be functioning more according to the way you were intended to, to function. But it's so hard to do when you've been battered abused, and, and I don't even know the other words, I mean, the, ty the tyrannical, the tyranny, the terrorism that's been perpetrated on all of us at times, to break our spirits, to break our self-worth, to break all of the things, or other things to pump us up so that we're run raging egomaniacs. I mean, it can go in any direction. We're not functioning correctly. You know, to, to, to fix this problem, we need to unburden and one of the things that really makes me smile is that I've witnessed in the last few years of our ministry a tremendous amount of unburdening. 
And that's helping to make people less toxic because they're unburdening. We have to get our self-worth and our pride and our ego and our humility into under, under, under condition. We have to deal with the shame. Oh, there's so much shame in the body. I'm not saying they should be ashamed. I'm saying they are ashamed. They, they are, they're fe- and, and a lot of times they feel shame for something that they didn't even do because they've been made to feel shame because the finger was pointed at them when really it wasn't even their fault. They were told that it was their fault. Now, may some of the things, certainly we bring the shame on ourselves. There's so much shame in the body. And it's hard to live with shame. How can you love yourself when you're ashamed? And so we have to, we have to unburden. Let's go to Matthew 11 and verse 28. Matthew 11 and verse 28. Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, Yeshua was speaking, come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I shall give you rest. Now, mostly we think of that of somebody who's like working too hard. I'm, I'm going to take this into another place. All of your emotional, psychological, and spiritual burden, all that mess that's been put on you, or that you put on yourself because you interpreted things and filtered things incorrectly in your life, And so you kept building and building on a wrong and false premise, and so you become heavily burdened. And Yeshua is saying, look, you who are laboring, any of you make a lot of efforts and labor to unburden or to fix, and you don't know what to do, and you've labored at it, and you've struggled at it, and you've gone to deliverance ministries and all these other nonsenses, and it's not worked. He says it's not that complicated. He said, all those of you that are heavily laden and burdened, he says, come to me, and I shall give you rest. He doesn't say that you need to go ahead and have certain special magical words spoken and certain prayers spoken and just repeat after me spoken. He simply says, come to me. Come to me and I shall give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am meek and humble in heart and you shall find rest for your beings for my yoke is gentle and my burden is light. What is a yoke? What does a yoke do? It keeps the animals in line and it steers and guides them. It steers and guides them. So a yoke is used to control and steer. And you've been controlled and steered in all the wrong directions. He says, take all that off and put on my yoke. What is his yoke? The Torah. The word from the creator. You know what it is? He's telling you, you know what? Other people have told you, you don't have an instruction manual. I do. Let me tell you what it says. And they're feeding it to you from their instruction manual for you. And you're buying it. And by the way, you didn't have a choice probably as you were growing up. So you, you know, I don't want you to say like, well, you know, now you're thinking, well, I must have been dumb. No, you weren't dumb. You had no choice. It started young enough probably. And all Yeshua is saying is, take the real instruction manual that you were supposed to live by and, and do those things. Because this book, this instruction manual is the right way for you. This is your manual. Not some man's manual or some other way of imposing something on you. Because you know when it says to impress on your children? Well, guess what? People have been trying to impress on you all your lives. But it hasn't been this stuff. And so that stuff has been impressed into you, and it's hard to unburden this thing, this stuff. But you have to unburden these things. If we can get to that place where we've done these things, then we can start worrying about and understanding what it means to be able to take care of and care for other people and provide for their needs. But it's very hard to do those things when we're so toxic and damaged, afraid of people, afraid of failure, afraid of what people are going to... We're so run by fear. Or we're so convinced that, that we're just inadequate and unworthy, and then we have, why would anybody want anything from us? But you know what? To live in community, not only are we going to have to love one another, we're going to have to learn to care and provide for each other, for each other's needs. Matthew 25, verse 31. I know you know these verses, but let's try and put it in a whole different context. Matthew 25, 31, it says, And when the son of Adam comes in his esteem, yes. are we talking about now what we're talking about? I mean, is, isn't this what we're talking about, the kingdom? He's coming in his esteem. He's going to go ahead and form this community that we've all been wanting and desiring. But look what's going to happen when he comes. When he comes in his esteem and all the set-apart messengers with him, then he shall sit on his throne of his esteem. So there's going to be a throne going on here. Okay? 
We're dealing with a king. We're not dealing with, I don't know, people said they've seen shirts. They're like, you know, Jesus is my homeboy. What? There's no reverence there. There's no respect there. I'm only quoting the name of the shirt for those of you that don't appreciate my using that name, but just understand that was a t-shirt that was out there in the stores. We have lost reverence for a king coming. We don't understand how to respectfully come before a king. And by the way, when it says, if you can't love your brother who you've seen, well, if you can't respect your brother who you've seen, how are you going to respect the Almighty? It all goes into, if you can't do it to someone you've seen, how can you do it to that which you've not seen? This is not something where you can turn the switch. You turn it on, you turn it off. It doesn't work that way. There's no turning the switch on and turning the switch off. Okay? So look what he says here. He says, look. He says in verse 32, And all the nations shall be gathered before him, and he shall separate from them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. And then the sovereign shall say to those on his right hand, He's saying to the sheep, he's saying, Come, you blessed of my father. Anybody want to hear those words? Yes. Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was uh, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous shall answer. Now notice he now said, the righteous, after he said the sheep, after he said those at his right hand. Now we're talking about what got them to be there was they were righteous. If you're not sure what righteousness is all about, listen to the teaching called the pursuit of righteousness. Righteousness is something you do, and the something that you do is Torah. And you do it with all your heart, with all your being, that's righteousness. So the righteous, the ones who walked out, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, the ones who walked out, all the things we quoted, Deuteronomy 10, 12, Deuteronomy 8, 2, John 14, 6, the ones who walked these things out, he said they're called the righteous, they're the ones sitting at the right hand. And those righteous are going to ask a question. They're going to say, Master, when did you see, when did we you know, see you hungry? When did we feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and took you in? Or naked and clothed you? When did we see you sick? or in prison and came to you. And the sovereign shall answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, in so far as you did it to the one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. That's completing the same metaphor, isn't it? If you can't do it to the one who you see who's in the flesh, how are you going to do it to the one who's not in the flesh? And he's telling you very clearly and very specifically that when you do it to the one in the flesh, you are doing it to him. He says, when you've done it to the least of these, my brothers, you have done it to me. And yet we treat each other horrendously a lot of the time. And so he's saying, look, and we're not just talking about, he said, when you were nice to people, he said, you saw me thirsty, you saw, you saw a need and you met the need. And we can go into all kinds of deep discussions as to the metaphorical understanding of what thirsty is and what hungry is and what, what prison is and what naked is. We got all kinds of ways we can take that, but let's just is keep it simple here as we go through the metaphor. And so he goes and continues and says, he shall then also say to those on the left, those are the goats, he says, go away from me, accursed ones, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his messengers. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in, and naked you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they shall also answer him saying, master, when did we see you hungry or thirsty? or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and we did not serve you. And then he shall answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, insofar as you did not do it to the least of these, my brothers, you did not do it to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. The righteous go into everlasting life. Those who are doing the doing. Walking the walk. There is a path. I am the way. You have to just follow the way. You know, we've done a lot of teachings where I've mentioned that path of righteousness that takes you from where you are to the kingdom door. And it's got a covering of blood above it that you are covered by while you're on the path. And when you get to the door, as your walk, you get to the door. However, the door is locked. Because you have not been able to do and can never be able to do enough to get through that door. But your righteousness was necessary to get you to the door. That's what he says right here in Matthew 25. 
He says, the righteous, he says, come sit on my right hand. They got to the throne. They, he said he gathered them all together. They got there and they were righteous and that's what mattered. However, we're still stained. We're still stained. The bride has an unblemished garment. That blood of Yeshua then gets applied to us and takes out all the stain and the door unlocks. But you have to get to the door. Yeshua even tells you, he's the door. And so to go through the door, you need to have the blood. But you got to get to the door. You can't just say, well, I believe in Messiah and I'm just going to do whatever I want. But I believe in him. That's not going to work. That's not, that's not going to work. Even the devils and demons believe. They're not getting in. It says that the people are going to be thrown into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his messengers. Okay, so, you know, we have that all playing out in here. So let's understand this as we go through this. This is what we're talking about in terms of the idea of we have to take care of each other. Okay, he says, what you do to the least of these, my brothers, you're doing it to me. And so we have to really understand as we go through this, as we're looking at this, that one of the problems that we have is that we have a needs, wants, disconnect in ourselves. And then we then kind of project that on other people. We don't know what a need is. We've lost that understanding, generally. You may think, what are you talking about? Well, let's define a need real quickly. Need is something that if you don't have it, you might die. Okay, need is something that you, if you don't have it, you'll kick, bite, punch, do anything. Let me, let me give you a description. If you are hungry, well, you're hungry. You don't need necessarily to eat right that second. You're just hungry. And your peace is a little bit disturbed because you're hungry. And you may start whining and griping about the fact that you're hungry. We've seen Israel do that, right, in the desert. Even if you're thirsty, you may be saying, well, I'm thirsty. Okay, and that's a want. And, of course, they whined and griped about it because until it's gone a long enough time, it's not really a need. It's just a want. But let's say while you're griping about being hungry or thirsty, I take a pillow and stick it over your face. And I start blocking your air. I promise you you're not worried about being hungry or thirsty anymore. At some point, you're only needing to breathe. You see how that changed everything? Because the need is the highest urgency. And so we, you come to realize at that point, you know what? I didn't really need food. I wanted food. I need to breathe. And we have a problem with needs. Oh, it's, it's, you know, it's, Black, Fr it's Black Friday. I got to go out and buy something. Everything's on sale. But you're broke and you have no money. Oh, no, but I have to. Oh, I need to go and get my, my Starbucks. But you're broke. How could you be affording Starbucks? Oh, I need... You know, to watch all these television shows so I don't have any time to listen to teachings or read the scriptures. Oh, I need to keep filling in all the dumb... Oh, I, I, listen, I am a fan of fans of this team. I don't miss one game. That is my life. No, well, excuse me? Where is your balance and your understanding of what a need is? Because that's when people run into trouble. I had somebody years ago who was coming up into leadership, and I missed him one Saturday... And I came to find out he went to the Vols game. And it's not because he wanted to go necessarily from that point. Somebody offered him something he couldn't resist. Free tickets. And he's thinking, but it's free tickets. And I'm thinking, but it's Shabbat. How could you even care about free tickets? There's disconnects in our wants and our needs. But I want to go. But you need to be at Shabbat. We have a lot of people still today that don't come because they don't feel they need to. They stay home sometimes. And they go when they kind of feel like it. Because they don't feel that they need to. Well, you know what the verses talk about? Not forsaking the assembling together. That's a command. And so unless you have a re a, 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 an actual reason, your health is bad. There's some sort of physical reason for you not to be there. You need to be there. Now, if you live five hours from a congregation, obviously you can't go to a congregation, so you can't fulfill that. So I know that makes you frustrated, but you can do the virtual. Okay, we have the on online live stream. But if you have a local congregation within a reasonable driving distance and you're not going just because I didn't feel like it today, that's not, that is not a viable excuse. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of things I can teach you from having been a personal trainer and other things that I've done in life that I can tell you that if you do it, the feeling will come after the action. That some of the best workouts I ever had was when I went to the gym when I didn't want to go. 
But once I got there and did it, ah, what a workout. You come to Shabbat when you don't want to be there, you'll get what you needed and you'll be glad you went. Because what you needed was there to snap you out of the funk you were in. The wrong thinking, wherever you were, you need the people and the assembling. Is this making any sense? But we have this needs, wants, disconnect. Because we come to the place, as a, especially as spoiled Americans, that we are, if I want it, I need it. I got to have it. All of the marketing you know, that we see on TV, hey, you got to have this stuff. You need this. You need this soda or this food or this, this vacation or this toy or this car. You need it. No, you don't. You only need very few things in life. You need your Messiah. You need the Torah. You need air. You need some place to lay your head. You need to sleep occasionally. I mean, it's not that, you know, there, there are some basic needs. As a matter of fact, you can go to countries where people are actually living in conditions that you would never believe. And somehow they're managing in those conditions. But we're so spoiled. And so we have this needs, wants, disconnect. And when we're so busy, worried about what we think is a need, how can you possibly see somebody else's need? There's no way. You're too busy, all upset about your want to worry about their need. Well, as soon as I take care of my needs, which means all my wants, I'll, I'll, I'll pay attention to you. You don't have that many needs. As a matter of fact, I, I can promise you pretty much all your needs are being met. I can promise you that. And so why worry about all those things? Plus, we can go to Matthew where it talks about we worry about this and how we, all these things that we think are needs. we we'll probably go there right now. Okay, Matthew 6. You know, in, in verse 31 it says, Do not worry then saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all of these the Gentiles seek after. Mm -hmm. Who are the Gentiles? Everybody outside the camp. Who are the, what do we call the believers on the inside of the camp? We call them Israel. There's Israel and Gentiles. That's what the whole world is broken up into sheep and goats. Well, there's also Israel and Gentiles. The problem is that some of the goats are thinking they're Israel and acting like Israel to some degree, but they're really not. They're hypocrites. Wheat and tares growing in the same place together because they may look like a wheat, but they're not. They can put on a good show. Anybody ever met some people that put on a good show until they finally expose themselves? And you realize it was all a show? That's not fun, by the way, when you have somebody who you become close to and they realize it was not really what you thought it was. That's real painful stuff. He says, all the Gentiles worry about these things. He says, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these. He says, but seek first the kingdom. Isn't that what we're talking about? And his righteousness, the path, the halakha, the way, and all these things will be added to you. So if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, all the stuff you need or think you need, because by the way, he mentions things like my clothes and this, and they all worried about, again, it's a needs wants disconnect. These are people that think they need all this stuff. Well, I, I need a nicer this, or a fancier that, or the latest this, or the latest that, really? You need all that? Now you sound like your children. But mom, I need. And then you tell them, well, no, you don't. Well, why don't you understand you have the same problem? And so the reason I keep harping on this problem is because it's making it impossible for you to see anybody else's needs. Because you're all wrapped up in all of these whining and complainings that the Gentiles do. In order to take care of other people and provide for each other, what we really need to do is you need to be selfless. Okay, that's what I'm really talking about, is being selfless. And I want to review from a teaching we did called Developing the Character of Yeshua, this idea of selflessness. Every time we act in, in, in self-interest, putting our own interest above other interests of other people, we are buying into and eating of the wrong tree, was what I was talking about in that teaching. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil versus the tree of life. Because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about me putting my interest about somebody else. And, and I, I go through the whole spectrum of this in that teaching. So you might want to go back and listen to that. But if we eat of the tree of life, we develop a selfless nature. So let me tell you what a selfless person looks like. It's only five bullet points, but it's incredibly powerful. A selfless person, a selfless person, cannot be offended. So don't tell me you're selfless when I've seen you get offended. If you're going to get offended, you're not selfless. You, the reason Yeshua didn't get all upset when they were spitting him out, because he's completely selfless. If you're completely selfless, you cannot be offended. A selfless person takes nothing 
Do you hear the word there? Nothing personally. A selfless person cannot take it personally because to take it personally, I have to be thinking about myself. A selfless person does not need to be right. <laughs> Oops, did I step on a toe there? That was me stepping on my own, by the way. A selfless person does not need to be right or convince others that they are right. We may need to post this on Facebook for all the people that are out there straightening out everybody to prove how right and smart they are. Stop doing that. Okay? And by the way, the key word is need. It's nothing wrong with wanting to be right. It's nothing wrong with wanting to share what you know that's right with others. But the whole point is the need. If I need to be right and I need to convince you to be right, I'm going to pound on you until you say uncle. And you say, yes, you're right, you're right, I give in, you're right. Do you understand? Anybody have anybody pound on them that way? Send you the email with the 57 attachments? Stop doing that too. That's not really. Those get the delete button real fast. Okay? And then people say, did you get my email? Yep. What did you think of it? I thought I needed to hit the delete button. That's what I thought of it. Why? Then they get offended. <laughs> because they're not selfless yet. I said, because you very rudely, unsolicited, sent me an email with like five books attached to it. Okay, or 57 attachments or whatever it was. And I've gotten those, and I'm not exaggerating. There may be a dozen or more attachments to try to make some case to argue, to tell me how stupid I am and how smart they are. Not interested in that conversation. Delete. Not because I'm thinking I'm so smart, just because the whole approach is wrong. Now, if you have something that you think is of value, and it has, a, I don't care if it has 57 attachments, if you ask me if it would be all right to send it, I may tell you yes. I may want to see it. But that's respectful. Okay? However, when I hit the delete button, I try not to be offended or angry or, or upset about it or take it personally. I just say, there's a problem here. I don't have time to deal with it. I'm just going to go ahead and hit the delete button. Okay? Does that make sense? Is that fair? Okay? Instead of going, oh, what a jerk. I can't believe you sent me that boink. Don't do that. A selfless person esteems others above themselves, puts others' needs above their own. We talked about that already, just what we were just talking about. And then a selfless person does not need things to be their way. You know why people can't talk about the calendar? Because most people that talk about it need it to be their way. It's, it's way beyond wanting. There are other issues like that too, where you can't talk to certain people about it because they are now dealing in a need, not a want. And so they're willing to fight about it. They'll bow up about it. They'll jump out of their chair about it. When people do those actions, you realize you're dealing with a need. So now you have some body language things that you've been made aware of about needs. When people can't keep calm in a conversation. What did I teach you guys in the part? If you read, and I hope you did, the participation guide, it said, if there's a subject that you can't talk about while maintaining the fruit of the Spirit, that subject is off limits during this feast. I didn't, I didn't name any subjects, by the way. I simply said, if there's a subject, any subject, that you cannot maintain your fruit of the Spirit while discussing it, then you are asked to not discuss it so that we can have peace on the property. But then it should make you think about, hmm, why can't I talk about that subject to maintain my peace? Exactly. Or if the person really has issues, they'll be like, well, how dare him tell me I can't talk about blah, blah, blah. blah. Oh, wait a minute. That has to do with, takes nothing personally, can't be offended. This is the type of person Yahweh wants to live with forever. A selfless person. So I want us to make sure we're understanding these things as we go through this, this study that if we're going towards community, and I know I hear this, it's so, it sounds so sweet and so nice and, and, and utopian, so to speak, to say, oh, if we could just have the first century model. Well... Most of the first century was spent with the believers being killed. So I'm not sure you want that model. But as they were building community, they were building it in a far more radical way than you were ready for. Amen. You were not ready for that community. In that community, first of all, there was leadership. There was clear leadership, clearly defined, trusted leadership. And that leadership was responsible for the all things in common deal. Everybody took everything and gave it to the leadership who then distributed it as needed. Do you guys trust leadership like that? No. 
But that was the leadership then. Oh, well, of course, but it was John and Peter and James. And, well, what, are they the only ones ever in the history of the world that should be trustable or trustworthy? There's never going to be trustworthy leadership again? Well, then you're never going to have the community you're looking for. Because the community you're looking for has leadership. When they came out of Egypt, Moses had, had clear leadership in place. Well, it took his father-in-law to get his attention, but he put clear leadership in place. Amen. There were heads over thousands, heads over hundreds. They were in charge of that group, and they reported to the heads above them. I assure you that when the heads of thousands had meetings, that the heads of hundreds were in those meetings. And the heads of hundreds had meetings, they had the heads of fifties and tens, etc. You know what I'm saying? In those meetings. So that Yeshua, and I showed it, so that Moses did not have to then speak to everybody. He called the heads of thousands together and had a meeting. I said, now you shift this down to the guys who are hundreds and tens and whatever, right? There was leadership. Clearly in the first century there was as well. Okay, that's why Paul, when there was an issue of concern with him, was brought to leadership at headquarters to deal with some issues. And so there was clearly a structure of leadership. And there will be leadership and clear leadership authority and structure in the future. Moses led them out, right? They had a leader lead them out. Then Yehoshua, Joshua, led them into the land. There was a leader. There were always human leaders leading them to the next step or phase of their journey. Why should we think now there's not going to be the same thing? What's changed? Oh, well, we have Yeshua. They had him too. They had a pillar of cloud and fire for crying out loud, and the, and the Almighty was speaking to them directly. But still, there was a human being leading them. There was always a human leader. They're supposed to be. We need that. You know why? <laughs> it goes back to the model we talked about before. If you do it to the one in flesh and blood, then you learn how to do it to the one not in flesh and blood. But if you don't do it to the one in flesh and blood, how will you ever do it to the one who's not? That's, the, that's a clear pattern here. So it's very important. And so we have to be very cognizant, hopefully, of all of these details. You know, part of the problem is, with all of this, is the whole leadership thing. We keep going back to it and back to it and back to it. And I will first and foremost blame the leaders. We have got to start with us first. It's the leaders. Everything is the leader's fault. You guys know that. We know that. But now what do we do after that? Because that not, that's not very productive. It's true, but that if that's where we stop, what's the, where's the use? The leaders are at fault, we know it, they know it, that's great. Okay, let's go home. What do you do? What we need to do is we need to, as leaders, become accountable and have a goal of becoming what we need to be. And that's what the MTOI leadership is trying to do, at least for our little group, is try to be accountable and to encourage each other and to have eyes, to have insight as to, you know what, I've seen something in you, brother, that if I, can, if, you, if, if I can talk to you about it, maybe that can help you get to the next step. And then he sees something in me, and this other one sees something in the other one. And we have these conversations to edify and encourage and uplift each other. And then we, as leadership, we start washing a whole lot of feet. We show that we're not there to control or to take advantage of, or to fleece, or to market to, or... That's all that's been going on for almost 2,000 years. So we have to show a new paradigm. We have to demonstrate a difference. And in doing so, we have to reach out to have a relationship then with the, with the flock. And to say, hey, can you give me a shot? Just give me, a, give me six months. Give me six months. Give me a year. Give me six. Give me a little. It would it be worth six months to see maybe this could actually work? You've always wanted it. You know you need it. I know you fought against it and everything because, after all, the only way to justify that you don't have leadership is because you say, well, all the leadership is bad because that's all I've ever experienced, so therefore, Yahweh must be trying to tell me we're not supposed to have leadership. No, that's the enemy trying to tell you we're not supposed to have leadership. Because the enemy's in there pushing all the buttons to get the leaders to act like jerks and fleece the flock and do all the other things that they've done. There's been tons of abuse coming out of leadership. I mean, there's really been almost terroristic abuse in some leaderships. Yeah. Not all, but I've seen it. Okay? And not only have I seen it, but I've got people in this room that have told me their experiences where they have had, and I have, I've actually had to counsel, not only on a regular basis, but even during this feast, people that came up to me, and part of their suffering was from abuses of leadership that they're no longer under. And they're still suffering the abuse that is, has long-lasting reverberations in their lives because of bad leadership. 
speaking into them, seeding into them, impressing, right? Impressing your, into your children, impressing into them lies, destroying their self-worth, destroying their, their, their belief that they have any value. So the leadership has to change that. But you guys have to give the leadership a chance. You have to. Because there's no other way that's going to work. There has to be hope that there could be good leadership. Because you're living with human beings. You're, you're, you're the head of everything is still your Messiah. But there has to be men, Moses, Joshua. There was always men, apostles. There were always men. Yes. There has to be men that we can look to and trust. Now, please understand they're not perfect. None of these guys, by the way. You look at all of them. They all have their flaws. So don't expect perfection. Examine them using Deuteronomy 8.2. Is it in their heart to be good leaders? Are they showing the demonstration that they want to do it right? That they want to be the right type of leader? Even if they're imperfect, are they demonstrating the fruit of their desire to show you that they are desiring to be this good shepherd who washes your feet, who cares for you to keep you safe and to help bring you and lead you to where you're supposed to go? Can you give the leadership that chance? If you do, we have a shot at community, real community. And the only way that's going to happen is you have to not only give them a chance, but come and get to know your leader. Because you may find that when you get to know them, they're not exactly how you got the impression just from the microphone or just watching it with somebody else. You may find they're a little bit different than you thought. And by the way, you may find somebody who's imposing, strong personality, like say for myself, a very strong personality. But you know what? That could be good for you. Because if I'm a good leader, that means that that strength of personality, that strength of leader, can then protect you. You may find it intimidating, but then later you may realize, but wait a minute, but if used correctly, instead of, instead of being like the other leadership you've experienced before where that was used as a weapon, maybe it could be used to, to protect you. Because that leader's strength of personality may also be a good thing to help keep the other stuff away. Because and, and, you needed a strong shepherd to keep the wolves away. To keep those that would threaten the flock away. Because a weak shepherd was not going to protect their flock. But you know, when you see, I'm sure that the wolves will start to get the idea. Certain shepherds, that guy's just going to come out and pound us. We'll go find another shepherd that's sort of just sleeping on the job. We'll go get his sheep. Okay? All right? And that's what it really comes down to. So I want to encourage us all to think about where we're going. Think about what's expected to get there and allow the opportunity for some people to be leading in your lives to help you get there. Because that's, that's the example we have. That's the example that we see. So as we look at the first century, and even before that with Moses and the Israelites, let's look at the real full picture of the model and then say, what could that look like now? Let's go before the Father. Avina Malkinu, our Father, our King. Father, we come before you and Father, we love you so much. And we want to be where you are. And we know that you've given us the path to where you are. You've shown us the way in your son, Yeshua. And Father, help us to see that completely. Help us to work on getting the stakes out of our own eyes. Help us to develop a selfless character in nature so that we cannot be offended and damaged and hurt and take things so personally. Help us to give leadership a chance and help the leadership to do the right thing. So that the leadership can be, so let's have the selflessness start with the leadership. Let's have them set the example, Father, and really get in there and wash some feet. And so, Father, let us love the body. Let us love the body, be willing to lay our lives down for the body. Let the body see the heart of the leadership to want to do these things. We're not going to be perfect, but let them see that it's our heart to do it, and we're going to make every effort to do it. So great almighty, we come before you looking forward to this journey from Mitzrayim to the promised land so that you would help us on this journey. You would lead the leadership who would then lead us to take us into the promised land, Father. That you would have us to be able to understand and embrace that you've given us the path that goes to that door. And you've given us Yeshua that unlocks that door. And that we might become, that we might become the children that you would want to live with forever, the people, the type of people you want to live with forever, 
so that we would be those kind of, that you would just be so excited and rejoicing to spend eternity with us. Because we are so looking forward to spending it with you. So Father, we come before you very awed and humbled by even the fact that we can come to you. That you have chosen us among all nations, that you've chosen us among all peoples to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts at this time to receive. And so Father, we are just humbled and awed and come before you in full reverence and respect under the authority given to us by your Son, Yeshua our Messiah, we come to you now, asking and seeking. Amen. Amen. Amen.